explore how the body is represented in the brain and the strange things that happen when the circuitry of embodiment fails. And finally, in part four, I'll close with some thoughts on why these ideas matter. So that's where we're going. Now let's move on to part one. Why this book and where am I coming from? This is a much younger me celebrating my thesis defense with my advisor, Ted Bullock. Ted is widely regarded as one of the founding fathers of neuroethology. Now ethology without the neuro prefix is the study of animal behavior in its natural context. The central idea of neuroethology is that to understand how the brain works, we must first understand the problem it's trying to solve. And we can best do that in animals that are highly specialized for a single, well-understood and easily measured behavior. For example, things like infrared vision in rattlesnakes, the electric sense in weakly electric fish, and song learning in birds, which turns out to be a remarkably useful animal model for understanding language acquisition in humans. My years with Ted had a profound effect on understanding living things, and especially my understanding of humans. And it was during this time that I began to see religious belief through the lens of neuroethology. I noticed something about religion that wasn't getting the scientific attention it deserved. That something was its infantile aspect, which I will illustrate with a few examples. When believers pray with upraised arms, they're like toddlers begging to be picked up by a loving parent. They're also like newborn infants who reflexively raise their arms that way when startled. In Christianity, you must be born again, that is, become an infant again, to be saved by Jesus. And of course, religious infantilism is all over the internet. I worship God in adoration for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Here the believer is a tiny helpless infant in the omnipotent hand of God. To me, all of this seemed to fit a pattern commonly seen, seen in ethology. Innate knowledge is an essential foundation for learning. There are many examples of this, like birds learning to sing and babies learning to speak. The neonates of most species have some innate expectation of what the world is like and what they need to do. One of my favorite examples is the behavior of sea turtle hatchlings. Sea turtles usually emerge from their nest at night, and when they do, they need to find the ocean. Their brains have an innate model of what the ocean looks like from a beach. The brightest area on the horizon must be the ocean. Now that's very crude and simple, but it works pretty well in a natural setting. White surf and shimmering waves reflect light from the, from the sky better than sand does, day or night. But the hatchlings are also learning. They have a magnetic sense, and as they swim toward the open ocean, they learn how their natal beach is oriented with respect to the Earth's magnetic field. Throughout their long lives, they will travel thousands of miles in the great currents of the ocean, all the while filling in a map of that ocean in their brains. Now, the coordinates are not latitude and longitude, but instead the strength and inclination of the Earth's magnetic field. Adult females use that map to return to their natal beach, where they lay the next generation of eggs. But in this age of artificial lights, a sea turtle's innate visual model of the ocean can fail catastrophically. At night, the light from beachfront homes can draw hatchlings away from the ocean and to their doom. In this case, the artificial light is called a supernormal stimulus because it excites the turtle's innate visual model of the ocean even better than the real ocean does. Sometimes adult female turtles are also drawn to artificial lights after laying their eggs, again, possibly with fatal results. Now this is surprising because as adults, they should be able to orient to the ocean using only their magnetic sense. Evidently, their innate visual model of the ocean persists into adulthood and somehow overrides their magnetic sense. 
This is directly analogous to my explanation for the illusion of God's presence in humans. Just as an innate model in the brain of sea turtles leads adults astray in the face of a supernormal stimulus, I suggest that an innate model in the brain of humans can lead us astray as adults. My hypothesis has three parts. Part one, just as a sea turtle hatchling has an innate model of the ocean and a longing to reach it, a human newborn has an innate neural model of mother and a powerful need to connect with her. And like the sea turtle's innate model, this one is crude and simple. Here are the essential elements of the model as I conceive it. A newborn infant knows that its mother exists, that she knows how to help the infant, that she is able to help, wants to help, and will help when she hears crying. Now, there's a bit more to it than that. The infant also knows that the mother has a face and a voice and that she provides warmth and nourishment. This crude innate model serves as the foundation for learning the specific details of the infant's real mother and for learning social behavior in general. Now in part two of the hypothesis, I suggest that the infant's innate model, like that of the sea turtle hatchling, persists into adulthood, but normally lies dormant. And finally in part three, the existence of this circuitry in the adult can give rise to the illusory feeling of a loving presence, especially, though not necessarily, under conditions that mimic the helplessness of infancy. These feelings are often interpreted in religious terms because God is a supernormal stimulus to the innate model of mother, just like artificial light to a sea turtle on the beach. God is a kind of super parent who answers prayers, is perfectly loving, omnipotent, and omniscient. These exaggerated attributes excite that crude model of mother even better than a real mother does. And when it's excited, the innate certainty of the mother's existence feeds the certainty of God's existence and the illusion of his or her sensed presence. Now, in my first book, I mainly concentrated on the behavioral evidence for this idea, and that was most of what you heard a month ago. But as someone who was trained in neuroethology, that wasn't enough for me. I knew we could learn a lot more from seeing how the brain does this. That's why I wrote The Phantom God. And that brings us to part two. What does religious compulsion look like under the lens of neuroethology? We tend to think of compulsion as a disorder, as in obsessive compulsive disorder. But there are some behaviors so critical to reproductive success that our compulsion to do them is clearly a good thing from the standpoint of evolution. For example, things like eating, drinking, mating, infantile crying, and caring for offspring are all great examples. Now, those last two have special relevance for this talk. If I'm right about the innate model of mother being a source of religious feelings, then studies of mother-infant attachment in non-human mammals might suggest where in the brain these feelings arise. For example, studies of rats might show us where to look in the human brain. Like human infants, rat pups are born helpless and completely dependent on their mother. She spends a lot of time in contact with them, but if she gets up and briefly wanders around the enclosure as she's doing in this photograph, the pups remain calm. The familiar sensations of being in the nest with their siblings are enough to keep them from crying. But if we take one of these pups out of the nest and put it in an unfamiliar place, then it instinctively emits ultrasonic cries for its mother. When reunited with her, the pup stops crying. This is called contact quieting. And this response develops uh, gradually over the first two weeks, but it is not a function of learning. It's completely innate. We know this because pups raised in isolation for two weeks show the same behavior at that age. And yet, if the pup is raised normally with its mother, there is learning going on. 
After the pup has had about a week to learn the scent and feel of its mother's body, a special kind of learning called imprinting, then under the right conditions, it reacts in a dramatic and unexpected way to its mother. Now, to explain this, I need to walk you through the experimental procedure, which was developed by Harry Scher and his colleagues at Columbia University. I'll be using his data and his cartoon drawings to show what's happening. Here the cartoon shows the mother and pups happily together in their plastic enclosure as in the photograph. One of the pups will be our experimental subject. And in this graph, I will show changes in its crying behavior with time on the horizontal axis and rate of crying on the vertical. So let's start with the control experiment. First, we take mom out of the nest and put her in a separate box. The pups, meanwhile, are still in the nest, which is being kept warm by a heating pad. So they're nice and warm and comfy and they remain calm. We leave them there without mom for 15 minutes. Now we move one of the pups to an empty plastic box at room temperature and leave it there for three minutes. It immediately starts crying. At three minutes, we move a litter mate from the nest into the box with the isolated pup and the pup's rate of crying plummets almost to zero. Just the familiarity of the sibling is enough to quiet the formerly isolated pup. This of course is contact quieting, which I showed you a minute ago. It would have happened even if we had moved only some wood shavings from the nest into the isolated box because the pup would recognize their familiar smell. Six minutes, we move the litter mate back to the nest and the isolated pup resumes crying at the same rate as before. No big surprises here. That's our control experiment. Okay, now let's start over from the very beginning so I can show you the surprising result. Again, the pups are with their mom in the nest. As before, we'll take mom out of the nest and put her in a separate box, but this time we anesthetize her. We don't want her behavior to confound the experiment. We're interested in the pup's behavior. And again, we leave the pups in their warm, comfy nest without mom for 15 minutes. Now we move one of the pups to the empty plastic box at room temperature and leave it there for three minutes. And as we saw in the control experiment, it immediately starts crying. At three minutes, we move mom, who is still asleep, into the box with the isolated pup. The pup stops crying, just as we saw in the control experiment. And notice that this is entirely a response to the mother's presence, not her behavior. She's not licking or grooming the pup. She's not feeding it. She's not picking it up. She is asleep. So far, this looks just like the contact whiting we saw in the control experiment, but there's something special about mom. At six minutes, we remove her, and now something really interesting happens. The pup resumes its crying, but at a much higher rate, sometimes double or even triple the initial rate. In the data I'm showing you here, we see about a 60% increase averaged over all the pups that were tested. This surprising increase in crying rate is called maternal potentiation because it is specific to the mother. If we do the exact same procedure using only nest material or a sibling instead of mom, the crying rate in the last three minutes is the same as in the first three minutes. That was our control experiment. Only a brief and temporary sensation of the mother's presence causes this enhanced crying behavior. Also, maternal potentiation makes ethological sense. If a pup fell out of the nest in the wild and then only briefly sensed its mother's presence, it would make sense for it to try extra hard to cry out for her because she's probably nearby. This is just the kind of behavior neuroethologists love. It's understandable, quantifiable, easily recorded, and reproducible in a lab. It's especially intriguing to me because maternal potentiation is an attachment behavior. It happens in the context of separation from mother and involves infantile crying exactly the situation in which uh, is the situation which in human infants would activate my proposed innate neural model of mother. Maternal potentiation behavior might therefore be a useful way to, in, in, the, in the form of an animal model, 
to study the illusory sense presence experience in adult humans. We might get some hints about the neural circuitry behind that illusion if someone could find a place in the rat brain that is specifically implicated in maternal potentiation behavior. Well, luckily, Harry Shear and his colleagues did exactly that. They took normal rat pups capable of maternal potentiation, injected the drug quinparole into a part of the brain called nucleus accumbens, and found that the drug specifically abolished maternal potentiation. And notice that it did not abolish isolation crying or contact quieting. It only eliminated the increase in crying rate after the isolated pup has briefly felt the mother's presence. Now we happen to know from other studies that quinparole activates a specific kind of dopamine receptor. So the neurotransmitter dopamine must somehow be involved in, in maternal potentiation. As for nucleus accumbens, here's a cross section of the rat brain at the level of nucleus accumbens, which is part of a larger structure called the basal ganglia shown here in blue. Nucleus accumbens is the lower or ventral part of the basal ganglia shown here in red. So again, just to recap, if we inject a tiny amount of quinparole into the nucleus accumbens, that abolishes maternal potentiation. But if we do a control experiment, injecting the same amount just a little higher up in the basal ganglia, it does not abolish maternal potentiation behavior. So it's highly specific to nucleus accumbens. Okay, this is exciting because now we have a foothold in the brain. Now we can ask some more specific questions. What do the basal ganglia and nucleus accumbens do? What do we know about them from other research? What does dopamine do in these parts of the brain? Well, the short answer is that the basal ganglia and dopamine are critical for learning behaviors that involve complex sequences of movement. For maintaining these skills once they are learned, for selecting among alternative behaviors, and for motivating the behaviors when they are needed. Different parts of the basal ganglia do these things for different kinds of behavior. In humans, for example, a distinct region within the basal ganglia supports control of the arms, legs, and postural muscles. We know this in part from the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, in which a deficiency of dopamine in the basal ganglia causes tremor, loss of fine motor control, and difficulty in initiating movement. You can see some of the effects of tremor in this handwriting example from a Parkinson's patient. Similarly, in songbirds, Dopamine and a special part of the basal ganglia are critical for the neural development of song through reinforcement learning. So what about nucleus accumbens, the place in the basal ganglia that's critical for maternal potentiation in rat pups? What does that do? Nucleus accumbens and dopamine signaling within it handle those critical behaviors that the brain compels us to do. Now, I'm not saying that nucleus accumbens is the whole story in these behaviors, it's not. Other parts of the brain interpret the animal's environment and internal state to recognize the need for the behavior, and motor cortex and other areas in the brainstem generate the behavior. And some parts of the basal ganglia besides nucleus accumbens may also contribute to some of these behaviors. But during the learning phase, brief dopamine-mediated signals of reward and punishment in nucleus accumbens are essential for reinforcement learning. Later, when the behavior needs to be expressed, the background concentration of dopamine in the basal ganglia, including nucleus accumbens, controls the motivation to act. And we can see this most dramatically in genetically engineered mice that cannot synthesize dopamine. They are so devoid of motivation that they do not eat and will starve to death with food right in front of them unless they are given injections of a dopamine precursor. Nucleus accumbens and dopamine are also important in drug addiction, especially in the early stages. Most addictive drugs exert their tenacious effects by increasing the concentration of dopamine in nucleus accumbens, either directly or indirectly. 
In effect, these drugs bypass the life-enhancing behaviors that are the natural path to reward and instead cut straight to the reward. Finding and taking more of the drug then becomes the overwhelming compulsion. But remember, it was a rat pup's longing for its mother that originally brought us to nucleus accumbens. We followed that lead in the hopes that maternal potentiation behavior might be a good animal, animal model for the feeling of a divine presence in adult humans. If that idea is right, then we should expect to see this kind of mystical experience. Um, when we see human subjects, uh, I'm sorry, we, uh, we should expect that this kind of mystical experience would increase activity in the nucleus accumbens, just as it did in rat pups when they were seeking their mother through exaggerated crying. So that's the in, important neural link here. And luckily in 2018, Michael Ferguson and his colleagues published a neuroimaging study that found exactly that result. They scanned the brains of 19 devout Mormon subjects as they practiced what Mormons call feeling the spirit and to give you some clue about what that means, I'll read you this uh, description of it from a Mormon website. Most of us have felt the comforting presence of the Holy Ghost at one time or another. Every one of us who has been baptized and confirmed has been given the gift of the Holy Ghost, which means we have the right, whenever we are worthy, to have the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. Young Mormons are trained to pray read scripture, and meditate on Mormon doctrine with the explicit goal of eliciting these feelings. So they've had a lot, of, a lot of practice at this. And that's what they did in the fMRI machine. But they also had a button they could press when they subjectively reached the peak intensity of feeling the spirit. And here are the results of the experiment, average across 19 subjects at the peak intensity of feeling the spirit. These three cross sections of the brain span the nucleus accumbens. Now you can see a lot of activity in the cortical regions near the top and sides of the brain, which is mostly related to focusing and directing attention. But I would like to direct your attention to the activity in the small structures indicated by these red arrows. That is the nucleus accumbens, one in each cerebral hemisphere. To my knowledge, this is the first direct observation of activation of nucleus accumbens in conjunction with a religious experience. It's a very significant experiment. And here's a detailed picture of the time course of activity in the nucleus accumbens relative to the instant of the button press at time zero on the horizontal axis. The signal is greater in the right hemisphere than in the left, but it reaches statistical significance indicated by the blue bars on both sides. Also, there's a time delay of about five or six seconds in this measure of neural activity. So the peak of neural activity in the nucleus accumbens actually occurred at about one or two seconds before the button press. The studies of maternal potentiation in rat pups and feeling the spirit in Mormons both implicate the nucleus accumbens this connection between infantile and attachment, but I'm sorry, this, this neural connection between infantile attachment and adult religious experience supports my hypothesis that relates an innate model of mother to the feeling of a divine presence. And because of other things we know about nucleus accumbens, these results may partly explain some long-standing puzzles. For example, why is religious belief so tenacious? People cling to their faith despite contradictory evidence, failed prophecy, corruption of the clergy, and sometimes great personal cost. Well, here's one possible answer from neuroethology. Considering that intense religious experience excites the nucleus accumbens, which also happens to be the epicenter of drug addiction. Maybe faith is tenacious because it is addictive. And here's another puzzle about religious compulsion. Why is religion so obsessed with sex? 
Why do preachers rail against sins of the flesh, only to be caught with their pants down doing those very things? Why do priests sexually molest children and adolescents? Why did male followers of this cult leader submit to castration in pursuit of holiness? And here's one of my favorite examples. This is Bernini's famous sculpture depicting the ecstasy of St. Teresa of Avila, ecstasy delivered by an angelic visitor. The scene comes from Teresa's memoir, and you don't need to be Freud to figure out what's really going on here. In his hands, I saw a great golden spear, and at the iron tip, there appeared to be a point of fire. This he plunged into my heart several times, so that it penetrated my entrails. When he pulled it out, I felt that he took them with it and left me utterly consumed by the great love of God. The pain was so severe that it made me utter several moans. The sweetness caused by this intense pain is so extreme that one cannot possibly wish it to cease, nor is one's soul then content with anything but God. This is not a physical but a spiritual pain, though the body has some share in it, even a considerable share. Like nearly all religions, Catholicism is strangely conflicted about sex. When Teresa entered the convent, she was taught that her celibate life to come is the price paid for the privilege of being wedded to Christ. Similarly, priests are told they are marrying the church. Yet they are also taught that sex is sinful. That's why they're supposed to be celibate and why Jesus was supposedly conceived without sex. Teresa's vision is unusual in that it embraces sexuality as a religious experience. So why is this? What's going on here? Why is religion so obsessed with sex? I think neuroethology has an answer to this puzzle, but there are many pieces to assemble. We have seen that both infantile longing for mother and adult longing for God share a common mechanism in the brain. It turns out that adult sexual pair bonding in monogamous species also shares this mechanism. The best evidence for this comes from studies of prairie voles, a social rodent that forms monogamous pairs. Now, this is a fascinating story. Unfortunately, I do not have time to give you the details except to say that nucleus accumbens and related neural structures are at the heart of it. Something similar probably underlies adult sexual pair bonding in humans. But by themselves, the connections I've shown you here still don't explain the strange obsession with sex in religion. There is one more critical piece to this puzzle. It has to do with the way evolution innovates by reusing what's already available. So please allow me a brief digression. For example, we know that the wings of angels did not evolve. They must be the product of an intelligent designer because they just magically appear tacked onto the body without repurposing the arms. By contrast, theropod dinosaurs also acquired wings, but only gradually and through the repurposing of their forelegs. The wings of birds evolved. Similarly, in making prairie voles and humans monogamous, evolution has evidently reused mammal the mammalian compulsion for attachment between mother and infant, tacking on some tweaking of the circuitry at puberty to redirect affection to one's mate. But if my hypothesis about religion is right, then that tweaking is somehow sloppy and incomplete. There's a downside to the way evolution has made us monogamous. It makes us prone to infantile feelings as adults. According to my hypothesis, the infant's innate model of mother persists into adulthood and spawns a kind of religiousness that casts the believer as a helpless infant in the hands of God, the super parent. The more pious the believer, the more infantile his feelings. But remember, this is happening in the brain of an adult whose attachment system has been tweaked for sexual pair bonding. 
This intense and infantile love of God therefore inevitably, inevitably spawns sexual feelings toward a parental figure. And that triggers yet another compulsive behavioral system, incest avoidance. Infantile and sexual feelings for God trigger revulsion at the prospect of incest. That is the missing piece to this puzzle, the compulsion to avoid incest. Because of evolution's careless shortcuts, the intensely pious tend to be flooded with feelings of love, lust, and revulsion, conflicting emotions of unconscious origin generated by innate mechanisms selected for neonatal survival, adult sexual pair bonding, and incest avoidance. The predictable result of this conflict is an obsession with controlling or prohibiting sexual behavior coupled with an almost irresistible drive to violate those prohibitions. Now, in this talk so far, I have tried to show that neuroscience of compulsive behaviors explains a lot about religion, but it is not the whole story. Neuroethology led us to the nucleus accumbens because of its role in compulsive behaviors. But this accounts only for part of the innate model of mother and only one aspect of the illusion of God's presence, the intense longing for a divine savior and the compulsive drive to reach it. One missing part of it is the spatial aspect of a sensed presence, the feeling that another being is physically nearby. This is handled in a completely different part of the brain. And that brings us to part three, religious phantoms. The central idea here is that there is a deep connection between the phantom limb of an amputee and the illusion of a sensed presence. And we can see that evidence. We, and we can see some of that evidence as a connection in the brain. I'll begin with a lesson that shows up repeatedly in neuroscience. Perception comes not only from sensory input, but also from what the brain expects. The brain's expectations make us more sensitive to important stimuli like fa human faces, so sensitive that we sometimes see faces that aren't there at all, like this famous one on Mars. Some of you may remember this from last month. In this case, the brain is filling in missing information <clears throat> in this ambiguous shape to make us see a face. Something like this, the filling in of missing information, also happens in the illusion of a phantom limb. But the percept is especially vivid because the brain always expects bodily sensations. Not only do we have the sense of touch from our skin, but we also have receptors in our muscles and connective tissue that sense the position and movement of our limbs. The perception of a phantom limb is so vivid and compelling that amputees will sometimes spontaneously try to answer a phone or break a fall with their phantom. And there's nothing uniquely human about this. Cats that have had an amputation will sometimes try to use their phantom to scratch themselves, to play with their pet human, or to bury their poop. Now, if you only remember one thing from this talk today, I want you to remember the impact of that video I just played. When I first saw those clips, I felt great empathy for the cats with their disabilities, but I was stunned at how real the phantom is to them. For people who have felt God's presence, their God is just that real and for the same reason. Illusions of embodiment are qualitatively different from other illusions. They come with a feeling of knowing that's hard to convey. 
Psychologist William James, who suffered from depression and was himself a religious believer, puts it this way. If you have intuitions at all, they come from a deeper level of your nature than the loquacious level which rationalism inhabits. Your whole subconscious life, your impulses, your faiths, your needs, your divinations, have prepared the premises of which your consciousness now feels the weight of the result, and something in you absolutely knows that the result must be truer than any logic-chopping, rationalistic talk, however clever, that may contradict it. Earlier I suggested that faith is tenacious because it is addictive, but this feeling of knowing is another reason. Faith comes from an illusion of embodiment. Now to understand this illusion at the level of the brain, we need to see how the brain represents the body. I'm gonna start with some diagrams and then I'll map these onto the brain. First, sensory information coming from the limb and command signals going out to the muscles are handled in different parts of the brain. The sensory part is called somatosensory cortex and the command part is called the motor system. Each of these is hierarchically organized, but I will illustrate that only for the motor system. And don't worry about the details here. I'm only showing this to point out that the higher level areas handle the conscious initiation and control of movements. And the lower level parts are the ones most directly connected to the body. The lowest level part of motor cortex is called the primary motor cortex. And you'll be hearing me use that phrase for the next few minutes. And similarly, you'll also hear me talk about the lowest level sensory part of uh, cortex, which is called the primary somatosensory cortex. And if all of this seems a bit abstract or confusing, seeing it on the brain might help. On the brain, the primary motor area is the strip of cortex colored green in this drawing. Similarly, the primary somatosensory area is the purple strip of cortex adjacent to the motor area and just behind it on the brain. In each of these cortical areas, the body is represented as a distorted but recognizable map. Each hemisphere of the brain maps the opposite half of the body. So here's a cross section through the primary somatosensory cortex showing the map that represents sensations from the body. And you can see just how dis distorted it is. And here on the other side, I will show the similar map from the primary motor cortex. Now this is representing the location of muscles controlled by each place in that motor area of cortex. Now the maps are distorted like this because a part of the body that needs delicate sensation or precise control of movement like the hand needs more neurons in the brain. We can explore these maps using strong magnetic fields. This is a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation. The magnetic field induces electric currents in the cortex just below the magnetic coil. Now this scrambles the normal computation in that part of the brain with some interesting effects. In primary somatosensory cortex, it yields illusory sensations on the skin. And in primary motor cortex, it causes involuntary twitching of the muscles. When this is done in the part of the map representing the missing limb of an amputee, the subject feels illusory touch sensations or illusory muscle twitching in the phantom limb. Over time, these low level areas get rewired in amputees. Notice how the hand is adjacent to the face area in both the sensory and the motor maps of the body. So if a hand is amputated, it's easy for neural fibers from the face area to spread into the adjacent hand area of cortex. If that happens, a touch on the face of the subject may then also be felt as a touch on the phantom hand. Another kind of change often described is a shortening of the phantom forearm, such that the phantom hand is perceived as being attached closer to the end of the stump, even if the stump ends near the elbow or the shoulder. 
Now, I've just given you evidence that the neural circuitry of embodiment can change, that it's plastic. But is it entirely so? Or is neural embodiment partly innate? When I was telling you about ethology, I said that innate knowledge is an essential foundation for learning in highly specialized domains. I also described my hypothesis of the innate neural model of mother, which requires some degree of innate embodiment. So this question constitutes a test of that hypothesis. Well, luckily there is some evidence on the question of whether or not neural embodiment is partly innate. One line of evidence for this comes from studies of transsexuals. These are people who feel they are trapped in a physical body of the wrong sex and seek gender reassignment surgery. Typically, they report having these feelings since childhood, which suggests there's something innate about this. Neurologist V.S. Ramachandran and Paul McGeeck hypothesized that an innate neural model of bodily gender develops prenatally as the genitals themselves are developing, presumably at the direction of hormonal signals. And just to illustrate this in a schematic sort of way, I'll show you an example where the two processes match, which is what typically happens. Uh, for example, a neural model of male genitals arises in the brain of a fetus that develops a male penis. In a minority of people, however, and for unknown reasons, the hormonal signals do not match in the two target, target structures. Now, maybe the dose of the hormone is too little in one place or it arrives at the wrong time. Whatever the cause, the two diverge. A neural model of a female body develops in the brain of a person with male genitals or vice versa. Ramachandran and McGee came up with an elegant way to test this hypothesis. If this aspect of embodiment is innate, then in a typical male brain, in a male body, the brain expects the body to have a penis. But the brain of a man who feels he's in a woman's body is a brain that has an incomplete or missing representation of the penis. His brain does not expect the body to have a penis. Men who transition to women should therefore be less likely to experience a phantom penis after surgery than men who undergo removal of the penis for other reasons like cancer treatment. And by the same reasoning, women who transition to men should be less likely to experience phantom breasts than women who undergo mastectomy for breast cancer. Well, the neurologist went ahead and did this study. And here's what they found. Transsexuals, the bars shown in blue here, have significantly lower incidence of phantom sensations than cancer patients who had the same body part removed. Also, in data not plotted here, 62% of female to male transsexuals described having phantom penis sensations before their transition. That's how strong their sense of male embodiment had been. Okay, so that again is fairly strong evidence for an innate neural model of the body. Another line of evidence comes from a similar mismatch between body and brain that occurs in the rare condition called xenomelia, in which a person experiences a normal and healthy limb as being somehow alien to their bodies, so much so that they seek its amputation. This is essentially the inverse of a phantom limb. The limb is physically present, perfectly normal, but part of the neural model of it in the brain is somehow missing or malfunctioning. These feelings typically appear in early childhood, more often in a lower limb, and only part of the limb is perceived as aliens. Like transsexuals, these individuals appear driven toward drastic surgery by a feeling so compelling that it persists in the face of bodily evidence to the contrary. And yet the most Im important, in my view anyway, and most dramatic evidence for innate embodiment comes from studies of subjects with congenitally missing limbs. 
The one I'm citing here describes a woman who had been born without arms or legs and yet had experienced phantom sensations of all four limbs for as long as she could remember. The numbers shown in this diagram are her subjective vividness ratings at specific locations on the phantoms, averaged over three separate sessions, with zero meaning no sensation and six meaning the most vivid. To test the authenticity of these phantom sensations, the subject was shown a series of drawings of a hand or a foot and had to identify them as left or right as quickly as possible. Subjects with complete limbs do this task by comparing the drawing to a mental image of their own hands or feet. And when the, when the digits are pointing down in the drawing as shown in the bottom row, this comparison requires a mental rotation, which significantly increases the subject's reaction time. And you can see a few examples of that in three control subjects shown here on the right. The time is a little bit longer and consistently so, significantly so, when they have to do a mental rotation. And when we do this in our subject who has the missing limbs, we see exactly the same thing. Uh, this and that it, which shows that she is using the same strategy, superimposing each drawing with a mental image of her phantom. But here's the most interesting part. These images show the activity in the subject's brain while she is sequentially touching each finger of one phantom hand to the phantom thumb. Now the pattern of activity is similar for both hands. But one of the most striking things is that the low level cortex, that is the primary sensory and primary motor cortex that would normally represent the hand, which is indicated in this drawing by the white arrows, that area is completely inactive in this subject. These would be the most active areas in an amputee who had lost the hand as an adult. Instead, when this subject moves her phantom fingers, the neural activity is in higher level motor areas in the frontal lobe and in the superior parietal lobe farther back in the brain. The authors conclude that representation of the body probably arises from a combination of innate and learned com components with the innate components mostly in these higher level areas. Now, the ones in the frontal lobe are known to be involved in conscious initiation of movements. But for our purposes, the parietal lobe is more interesting. This is where abnormalities are found, for example, in subjects with xenomelia, the desire to amputate, amputate a limb that feels alien. It's also, it's also where we see a connection between the embodiment of the self and the perceived embodiment of others. One of the first people to make this connection was British neurologist, MacDonald Critchley, who put it this way. Among the vague and curious anomalies of corporeal awareness or body image occurring with lesions of the subordinate parietal lobe, an idea of a presence may intrude. This intangible feeling, perhaps amounting to a firm belief, but subsequently proving to be erroneous or delusional, is so unexpected, so incongruous and uncanny as to disturb the victim. Like the amputee and his phantom limb, he may well prefer not to mention it. It's no accident that Critchley compared the illusory sense presence to a phantom limb. The two share common neural hardware, something Critchley inferred from his patients. One of his patients felt that the left half of his body did not belong to him. While, while walking, this patient would sometimes get the notion that he was being followed behind and to his left by another person. When he had this sensation, he lost the feeling of strangeness that had, had affected the left side of his own body. What Critchley called the subordinate parietal lobe is today more commonly known as the inferior parietal lobule, part of the transition zone between the temporal and parietal lobes, or more commonly called the temporoparietal junction. Now that name is a mouthful, so I will abbreviate it to TPJ, 
but what it does is fascinating. In essence, it handles the neural embodiment, the self and of others in many amazing ways. I wish I had time to tell you about all of them. But instead, I want to concentrate on what Critchley was pointing out here, the feeling of a presence. Direct electrical stimulation of the TPJ can sometimes elicit the illusion of a sense presence. This paper describes a patient with a history of epileptic seizures in the left temporal lobe. At onset, she would slowly turn her head and eyes to the right, though she had no memory of this after the seizure. While searching for the focus of her seizures with stimulating electrodes, her physicians found that direct electrical stimulation of her left TPJ gave her the illusion that another person was standing behind her on her right side. She could not explain how she knew the person was there, but she felt that the sensed presence was threatening. Here's another example. As in the previous case, this was an epileptic patient whose cortex was being mapped with stimulating electrodes. When her left TBJ was stimulating, was stimulated, she felt the presence of a person directly behind her. When she was lying on her back during the stimulus, she felt that person lying beneath her. When she sat up in bed and clasped her arms around her knees, she felt the other person's arms around her upper body a sensation she found disturbing. When asked to do some simple tasks with her hands during the stimulus, she said the other person was trying to interfere with her actions. The sensed presence so faithfully mimicked this patient's behavior that it was obvious to the neurologist that she was misperceiving her own body as an alien presence. The patient was aware of this mimicry but she never interpreted the presence of her own body, evidently because her mind could not penetrate the illusion that another person was there. All of this strongly implicates the TPJ in the awareness of the presence of another person. And that makes it a likely component of an innate neural model of mother. If my central hypothesis is right, the TPJ should also be a critical component of the illusion of God's presence felt by an adult. But I need to make some disclaimers about this point. The kind of sense presence that comes from electrically stimulating the TPJ is not exactly what I have described as coming from an innate neural model of mother. In the neurological examples I just gave you, the sense presences were disturbing or threatening not unconditionally loving. The spatial and personal aspects of the illusion were there, but the longing and attachment were not. Those things come from elsewhere in the brain. I've listed here some of the important places I've neglected in this talk. Now in the book, I do my best to complete the story, but we just don't have time for that today. In the last chapter of the book, I list some testable predictions and my suggestions for experiments. I don't have time for those either, except to give you my overarching prediction, prediction that they all exemplify. The crying of a newborn for its mother and the helplessness of an adult in despair should share a common neural mechanism in the brain. Similarly, the love and security felt by a suckling infant, and the feeling of ecstatic union with the divine presence should also share a common neural substrate. The correspondence of these infantile and adult mental states should be evident in similarities of localization in the brain, of neural, neuronal activity, and sensitivity to drugs. If that correspondence cannot be found, then the hypothesis is wrong. Now, maybe the hypothesis will fail and be discarded. But what if it passes? Suppose we find that deep commonality in an infant's neural representation of its mother and, a, and an adult's neural representation of a mystical presence. So what? Why does any of this matter? 
Since prehistoric times, humans have tried to explain what they don't understand as the actions of supernatural beings. But with the rise of modern science, we've discovered natural explanations. Today, there are few educated people who seriously believe that thunder and lightning come from Thor's hammer. As the gaps in our knowledge shrink, so does the God of the gaps. But this gap, the God-shaped vacuum in our hearts and minds, is one of the few remaining places where the God of the gaps still hides, even for scientists as distinguished as Francis Collins or my own thesis advisor, Ted Bullock. If it can seduce them, no wonder it captures billions more. If my hypothesis passes its tests, we will have a completely natural explanation for the feeling of God's presence, an explanation grounded in evolutionary biology, ethology, and neuroscience. It will mean that we better understand why we invent religions and long for that mystical other. And if my hypothesis fails its tests, it will not mean that God wins by default. With luck, the experiments that shoot it down will hint at better hypotheses. With cleverness and hard work, we will eventually tease out the truth from among them. That is how science works. Science brings us ever closer to reality and having a firm grip on reality is good for human flourishing. The science of electricity did more than merely vanquish Thor. It opened our eyes to the majesty of the real cosmos. It brought us the modern world. It even made this Zoom meeting possible. We live in a paradoxical time. Cultish tribalism and religious groupthink threaten our democracy. And yet secularism is growing in America, especially among the younger generation. My hope is that a scientific understanding of where religious religion comes from will help in, in all of this. For me, at least, that's why all of this matters. You can learn more about this at my website, watheresearch.com, and of course, even more in my book, The Phantom God. And with that, I will be happy to take questions. And let me just quickly turn off sharing here. Wonderful. And just as a little reminder to the people who are on our YouTube channel, please like and subscribe. It really does help us. Um, with that, I'm going to be taking questions from the room. If there's any questions on Zoom or on YouTube, please put them in either the chat on either of those platforms and we will read them aloud to make sure that everybody can hear them in the room on Zoom and they can be answered. So with that, to give everybody a chance to write questions, does anybody have a question from the room? You just raise your hand and I'll come bring the mic to you. It was just explained so well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then I will ask my question that as a child who had an abusive mother, and is now somebody who would consider themselves secular or an atheist, do you believe that that abuse from a mother could impact becoming an atheist at a higher rate? Yes, it does. I think there's, there's actually some research on this subject. It's um, a little, it's not quite as simple though, as you might think. The, the pattern that's been found is that, um, well, the, the, what I'm talking about here are, are studies of what's called attachment, that use John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth's attachment theory of child development. And a scientist named Lee Kirkpatrick and his colleagues extended that theory into the study of the development of religiousness. Uh, they began this research back in the 1990s, so there's quite a bit of research on it. And what they, what they looked for were um, distinguishing differences in religiousness in adults who had different patterns of attachment as adults, as children. And they distinguish two basic kinds of patterns of attachment, what are called secure attachment, where the child has a parent or parents who are responsive to the child's needs 
and and who and who the child whom the child feels are trustworthy, um, as distinguished from insecure attachment, um, where you have the opposite, where the child where, where the parents are somehow negligent or inconsistent in their responsiveness, or even at, at greater extremes, physically abusive, as you experienced. So in the in the case, what the, the basic finding is that in secure attachment, um, the religiousness of the offspring of the, of the adult who had secure attachment tends to be similar to the religiousness of the parent. So if you have a, a secular non-religious parent who was kind and loving and responsive and gave you secure attachment, you are likely to grow up to be secular yourself. And if you had a parent who was highly religious and negligent or abusive, you're likely not to be. So there's, there tends to be a, 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 that correlation. Um, Thank you. So, so yeah. that, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of the essence of the finding. Yes, uh, my dad, who was my positive parent, was secular and brought me to the Humanist Society of a Greater Phoenix. And my mother was the abusive one who was extremely Christian. So exactly what you said. So you seem, you seem to fit I that pattern. I'm a piece of data. Yes. Uh, <laughs> any other questions? Wonderful. Mine is not necessarily a question, but I just wanted to say thank you as someone who grew up in a Pentecostal church. Uh, I've had a very hard time coming to the, understand that whole background. And I just want to thank you for your books and for your research. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I congratulate you. It's, it's, it's difficult to tear yourself away from religion. I know I, I did it as a teenager. It's harder. You, you know, the, the more extreme the religion, the harder it is. And, and the one you describe is pretty extreme. So congratulations. This might be a little to the side of your subject, but twice in my life, I have met a woman two different women in two different states. They never met each other. The woman was atheist, was very, very close to her mother, and the mother was a Christian. This is two different sets of mother and daughter. Mother's a Christian, daughter's an atheist. Mother gets very, very sick. Daughter sits with her while she dies. And right after mother dies, daughter gets religion. And I always thought that it was because they couldn't bear the thought that they would never see their mother again. But if they became Christian, then they could believe that they would see her again. And now listening to your talk, I'm thinking maybe it's more complex than that. It may be. It's um, the, you know, the, the time that you describe there when you're caring for a dying loved one, especially a dying parent, a dying mother, someone to whom you're presumably deeply attached and close, that's, that's a time of great emotional turmoil, a great emotional crisis. It's very common to cry out to God in prayer if you believe in God in, in times like that. The, the most intense kind of, of praying that I think is most closely related to infantile crying comes in moments like that. So uh, yes, I think that it's, it's entirely possible that they were feeling a very infantile feeling in that moment, not just because they were with their mother whom they loved and had that relationship with ever since childhood, but because they felt helpless, they couldn't stop this from happening. It's, it's entirely possible, yes. Thank you. Hi, um, I was just wondering if there was any uh, research or information that might connect uh, people that reject religion later in life or that have had a religious background and have become secular later in life and if there's any overlap with addiction or resilience to becoming addicted or to different things whether it's drugs or gambling or anything like that if people have a stronger uh, like if it's if there's any relation to the two um the, the one thing I can say about that is that um, there is some literature on um, 12-step programs, which are fairly successful, not 
exclude not not I wouldn't say they're you know necessarily the best approach, but they are a good approach. A lot of people use them for for trying to break an addiction. They depend for their success, I think, on having support from other people, from 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 forming social connections, for being part of a group. That's that's a big part of it. But another part of it is this feeling that they, or this almost ritual that they go through in these meetings of turning their problem over to a higher power. Now, they're not strictly a religious group. They don't have any kind of theology or doctrine or dogma, but they do suggest that turn it over to you. You should turn it over to your higher power, however you conceive of that. And each person does that. It has been suggested, I'm not the first to suggest it, but I, uh, I, I mentioned this at one point in my, in, in my book that the 12 step program with its dependence on turning the problem over to a higher power may be kind of substituting one habit for another, substituting uh, an addiction to, to a connection to, a, to, to God, which as we saw earlier, taps into the same part of the brain as addiction to drugs. So you may, it, so it, I call it a spiritual methadone. You, turning to religiousness, turning to a higher power may be helpful for, for just that reason, that it's another kind of addiction. And, and if that works for people, that's great. Um, it doesn't work for everyone. Wonderful, thank you. So we are gonna take a question from Zoom and then I will come back to the room. So this is from Susan Sackett. If the mother figure is what one is longing for, why is God always a male? Shouldn't it be a goddess? That's a great question. And I th and thank you for asking it because I, it's, some, it's, a, it's a topic I completely ignored in this talk. If you, if you heard the talk I gave a month ago, I talked about it a little bit there, but I kind of downplayed it there too, just for lack of time. Um, what I have suggested here, this hypothesis I've suggested, does not explain everything about religion. At most, maybe half, maybe not even that much, but certainly it does not explain what you just mentioned, which is the, um, the side of God that is, is perceived as being judgmental, authoritarian, patriarchal, usually male, uh, fearsome, punishing, also rewarding, but, but fearsome and punishing. The, the, the God of heaven and hell, that kind of God. Um, that's an important aspect of religion. And that's where most of the scientific study of religion has been directed from, from psychologists and anthropologists. And that there's, there's a lot of literature on that. There are good explanations of that. That has to do with um, so human social behavior. Um, Basically, this kind of God was useful at one time in our, in our history as we made the transition from small hunter-gatherer groups into large agricultural settlements and civilization. If widespread belief in a punishing God who, um, who's omniscient and omnipotent can, can help to simplify the enforcement of society's rules and assure that everybody cooperates. That's basically the idea. But I want to point out, though, that both of these, both of these, I think, are innate in human nature. Both of them are very powerful components of human nature, these two sides of religion, and they give God kind of a two-faced nature. Believers, they, they, they both show up in, in religions and to different degrees, and it's almost impossible to get rid of them. Even a, a, a patriarchal religion like Catholicism that prohibits women from even being, you know, holding positions of authority or, or from being priests, even that religion, even in that religion, the maternal, unconditionally loving female aspect of God creeps into the religion, whether the, the Pope wants it or not, in the form of veneration of the Virgin Mary, for example, or veneration of the female saints who outnumber their male counterparts two to one in Catholicism. So it's a fascinating story and a, a great question. Thank you for that. Thank you. Are there any other questions just really quickly? Okay, awesome. So this is in relation to your comment that you made earlier about um, 
how someone feels when they are with someone that's that's passed away and as far as their you know where that person's going to go um my son passed away seven years ago and it was i guess i'm just really starting to understand the connection between how people feel feel people feel about religion compared to like an addiction it's kind of hard to explain but I still feel that need for wanting to know that my son is someplace that I will see my son someplace so it's it's really similar to a feeling of addiction of wanting that next drink that next something Um, it's very hard for someone who grew up religious to disconnect. I mean, it's really just a rip of a Band-Aid. And so when you do go through that, it is a process. And then, of course, on top of that, I had relatives that, you know, oh, you'll see him. And, you know, do I have a lot of religious relatives? So it's a very hard, very traumatic thing. Not that any death isn't. I mean, every death is traumatic. But when you have to deal with the fact that in your head, you know, realistically, that that's not going to happen. And yeah. you know, I think that a lot of people that are religious, they, they need that. They have, it, it's a drug that they have to have in order to comfort themselves. I think that's a, that's a very uh, deep insight that you have there. I, I, I agree with you. I've, it's not, it, it actually it taps into, I think both of the topics of the talk today that, um, not only is it something that some people can't let go of, just like an addiction is, is almost impossible to let go of. It's, it is, again, like I said, an illusion of embodiment that you, you knew your loved one for so many years. You experienced their presence you know, throughout your life they meant so much to you that you have a neural model of that person in your brain. And when that person dies, that representation in your brain is still there and it's just as vivid to you as it always was, just like the representation of an amputated limb. It's, it's a, it, and it's, it's so strong, it's so powerful. Um, some people under the right conditions, especially in darkened rooms or um, feelings of or, or times of sensory deprivation, covering your eye, your hands with your covering your eyes with your hands when you're crying or whatever, when you're in mourning. It's very easy to have the brain project that out into the world around you and feel the presence of the person who is gone. And I'm sure this is where a great many ghost stories come from. The, to the person who has them. It's not a story. It's real. It feels just as real as the phantom limb feels to, to the amputee as it felt to those cats in the video. Um, it's, it's a very powerful thing. Thank you. Uh, this is going to be our last question. So just as a heads up. Thank you so much for your work. Um, I just had a question about this study, the Mormon study. Uh, you mentioned that they pushed the button and was, was it right before the experience peaked? That was my question. Their, they- their, their instructions were to press the button when they felt the peak of the experience. Okay. And did and you it's... happen to say that they were pushing the button right before, like a, a second or two before the experience actually what, the, snapped the, inside the, of the brain? The, the point... Uh, the, the point I was trying to make is when I when I showed you the graph of the neural activity rising as a, versus time, it looked like superficially it looked like they were pushing the button before the peak occurred. But um, the reason for that is completely an artifact of the way we're measuring neural activity in that experiment. What we're actually measuring this is fMRI. We're actually measuring um, something that happens when when neurons get active in a part of the brain. They demand more metabolic energy, and they, the blood flow are in that area increases. The capillaries dilate a little bit, and the blood flows, and the, and the oxygenation state in the blood changes. And that is what you can detect with the F- fMRI machine with magnetic resonance. It's the molecular state of the oxygen that you're really detecting. 
Now there's a delay between the time the neurons are firing and responding to something and the time the blood flow and the oxygenation becomes a detectable signal. That, and that delay is about five or six seconds. So if you just look at the graph of the change in blood oxygenation, it looks like the peak is happening after the button press. But if you subtract out that five or six seconds, then you can see where the activity in the neurons was peaking, which is what's really relevant. And there you see it's happening about a second or two before the, the neural activity peaks about a second or two before they press the button. And that's what you would expect. You would expect them to have some reaction time between the feeling the peak and pressing the button. Okay, okay, there we go. I just wanted to say thank you so much for your, your series of talks that you've given to us. We greatly appreciate it. And uh, as always, um, we welcome you back and, uh, anytime you'd like to promote a new book or a new idea, we'd, we'd certainly uh, welcome that. Uh, at that, I believe Catherine is going to turn off the YouTube stream for us. <laughs> and we do have a raffle for the book. So, all right. So 